types the debt that's the debt that's associated with um, uh, medical school because a lot of your MD PhD programs are going to be fully paid for. So that means that your medical school years are going to be paid for, PhD years paid for, and you're also getting a stipend on top of that. So you're being paid to go to school. Um, and and it, that's going to be for the majority of those uh, programs. So they could be funded through the NIH or an independent um, funder, but it's mostly going to be paid for. And of course, that provides you research training that's going to be rigorous during that high school time. And then in the end, you're going to be more competitive for research positions. So for example, the PSTPs, or um, uh, if you're applying for grants at the faculty level, and you've shown that you can get grants at the, the graduate PhD level. Of course, the con is going to be, it's, it's a very long training time. So the amount of time that you put into a PhD can really vary three years, seven years, you know, pick your number. Um, and you may end up only using one degree. So you might be more medicine focused or more of the research focus. It just depends on the split that you end up seeing yourself in. And of course, it's going to be difficult to keep up with the clinical knowledge during your PhD training. Um, but I would argue that you really, I think it's it's two different types of training. And, and um, uh, you know, regardless, you're going to lose out on some of that preclinical stuff going into the clinical, even if you just went straight through without the PhD. Um, but some some programs do have um, like clinical hours that you do have to keep up with during your PhD. So that could aid in keeping up with some of that clinical information. So how to get into these MD PhD programs. So the admissions process is going to be similar with the medical school, but you have additional essays that you do have to write. So you have to talk about why you want to do an MD PhD, what significant research experiences have you had in the past. So of course, research is going to be very, very important here. And of course, the coursework that you do in your undergraduate years. So the school that you're applying to really look into the type of classes that they need, and that's going to vary by school. And of course, your MCAT and your GPA are going to be important parameters that are considered when um, applying for the MD PhD. And lastly, volunteering, leadership experience, and of course, shadowing, it's also going to play into your application. Um, especially with the shadowing, I mean, you can't say you want to be a physician if you've never shadowed a physician, right? So make sure you have all of these um, opportunities. And then also make sure you're getting strong letters from these people. So how can you get involved in research? So let's say you are at an institution that's you know not doing a lot of research currently. Try to get in contact with neighboring institutions. Or I think really the big thing is the summer research program. So any institution doing research is mostly going to have these summer programs that are geared towards undergraduate students. So try to get involved in one of those. Or if your school does do research, maybe talk to your biology professor, your chemistry professor to see if you can get involved in something. Um, and I would argue that it's more so about the quality of your research experiences as opposed to the quantity. So being in a lab for two years as opposed to three different labs within two years, you know. Um, and, and you want to show that you have uh, built some type of growth towards independence. So you um, have initiated different things in your lab. And over time, also, you want to present your research. Um, publications, you know, it's not an end-all be-all if you don't have it in, in the end to match into uh, MD-PhD programs. But uh, presentations, I think, are really nice. And going to conferences as well, you really get to network with many different people. So try to get those in as well. And we talked about these summer research experiences, but you can get a research assistantship too at your school. And then let's say you do some gap years or a gap year, you can get involved in post back research or even doing a master's, um, things like that. So at this point, I will let Ankita take it away. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I just want to thank the Jedi team and APSA for having me. Um, I'm really excited to present about social science and humanities programs. Um, I think one of the biggest things I hear from applicants is that they wish they knew these programs existed earlier. So um, this is an effort to kind of um, expose as many students as possible to the number of PhD programs that are available. Um, next slide. Um, we can just go to the next slide, thanks. So what is the social science and humanities pathway? So as Sara kind of explained, 
Um, MSD programs traditionally fund um, PhDs in the biomedical sciences. So there's biochemistry, microbiology, but within the, <clears throat> the past 15 years, um, many universities have made a very compelling case that an expertise in the social sciences as well as medicine um, is extremely valuable for both fields. Um, and so these programs um, offer a variety of social sciences. I personally am in anthropology. I am in my fifth year of total MD, PhD anthropology. So um, what that means is I did two years of medical school and I'm starting my third year of my PhD. But there is a variety of other PhD options that universities um, across the country offer. There's the history of science and medicine, there is health policy, epidemiology. Um, one thing I will say, and we'll touch upon this a little bit later, is that you have to be a little bit proactive about which programs are available and when, because these can change. <laughs> and so um, the structure of these programs is typically the same as the rest of your MSTP cohort. Um, for me and for the, I would say the majority of schools um, that participate in this program do the two, four slash five, two um, uh, organizations. So two years of med school, your PhD, and then you finish out the last two years of your med school. Um, but this uh, may vary depending on the school and the length of the PhD may vary. So for my school, the PhD for anthropology is typically five years. In other schools, it may be four years or six years. Um, so a running theme throughout this is that um, there are some nuances between different universities. So you really have to do some of your own detective work to figure out what is the best fit for you. Uh, next, okay. So I thought it would also be helpful to elucidate a little bit about what some careers after the SSH pathway are. Um, I'm a little biased because I'm from the anthropology side, um, but at least for MD, PhD anthropology um, graduates, some of the very first graduates of this program were Jim Kim and Paul Farmer. Um, I, I feel like a good amount of people know who Paul Farmer is, but um, for people who don't know, Paul Farmer was a physician anthropologist. Um, he graduated from Harvard and he went on to do a lot of global health work, um, a lot of innovative ways to partner with local governments to um, create different types of nonprofits. So the one he's most famous for is Partners in Health. Um, Jim Kim went on to um, lead the World Bank um, and the rest of the, the names are um, various physician scholars. So what a lot of these doctors do is that they'll have a associate professorship um, at a university, and they'll also <laughs> do clinical work. Um, and I just put a few of the books that um, these graduates have gone on to write. Um, so for anthropologists, um, the end of our piece, she culminates in an ethnographic book. Um, and so that is basically the culmination of our qualitative research. Um, and so one that gets published differs based on um, different training programs, but these are just some examples. Okay, so um, this slide is adapted from a colleague of mine, Michelle Muniqua, who is an MD, PhD anthropology graduate. Um, she's in med peds, uh, I believe finishing off her residency or fellowship right now. Um, and I thought these questions were really helpful. This can also be found on her personal website. She has a page dedicated to um, advice for applicants. Um, and I think this can apply even to people who are not considering SSH programs, because when I was reading it, I thought, wow, these are really great considerations to think about when you're considering these programs. First, do you want to see patients or would you be happy if you worked in the sphere of health? Do you want to be a clinician, researcher, or both? For me, I was um, really drawn by the qualitative methodologies that anthropology provided, specifically ethnographic methods, participant observation, and I really found a symbiotic relationship between these methods and patient care. And I, I couldn't really see myself doing one or the other. So um, that's how I decided to uh, go forth with this program. 
what are your personal life goals? So say in 10 years, what would have to be true in order for you to be happy? Um, do you want to have a career where you have dedicated research time or do you only want to do um, clinical work? What's nice about um, getting the PhD is that you have the credentials to say and argue for um, dedicated time outside of your clinical time um, for research to either lead a research teams, do your independent research, um, et cetera. Graduate school and medical school are also very culturally different. Do you prefer time to be structured by other people? Um, so this is very much how medical school is. Um, you have your didactics and then you have your rotations or by yourself. Um, do you feel flexible about switching between the two? I'm halfway through the PhD program and I will say it's very self-directed. Um, we do um, take uh, several seminar classes but your research um, is very independently driven. So what is your learning style and how do you want to um, go forth with that? What kind of skills will you need to do the things that you want? What are your strengths and where do you have room to grow? What specialties are you interested in? Are these specialties traditionally ones which allow for robust careers in research? One thing I will say is that for the SSH pathway, there's a growing diversity in the types of specialties people are pursuing. So for anthropology, for instance, in the beginning, internal medicine and psychiatry were kind of the most common. Um, but now I know graduates who are pursuing surgery, pathology, um, OB-GYN. So um, the, the variety is, is quite large. Um, and then finally, what kinds of financial resources do you have and what are your financial goals? Are they compatible with an extended period living on a graduate student's salary? For instance, um, if, uh, if you have a child um, and other people are depending on you, um, what are the possibilities um, with the salary versus, say, going to medical school and not doing the PhD? Um, what benefits do your prospective programs offer as well? So in terms of application tips, I would say um, there are many similarities to what Sara was describing. One is to um, try to get involved in research as early as possible. And I think what's difficult about the social science and humanities pathway is that some people are not exposed to the social sciences in ways that they're exposed to the sciences. It's not always like a prerequisite. Um, I would say a lot of people begin to um, pursue this career after taking an intro to anthropology course or intro to history and science and sociology of medicine course. Um, and I would state starting from these classes and networking with the professors and asking about research opportunities is a great way to start. Um, and as I said before, each university has different types of programs and certainly not all MST programs offer an SSH pathway. Um, in the next slide, I'll show uh, the database that my committee has made that kind of lists what programs are available and where, um, but you'll also need to be doing um, kind of your own research as well as um, reaching out to program directors, social science and humanities program directors to um, not only communicate your research interests, but also see what they have to offer and if it's a good fit for your career interests. Um, in the application itself, um, a lot of schools will ask you to write kind of a mini research proposal. And this is not binding per se. Mine has definitely changed. I remember reading it a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's very different from the type of research that I'm doing right now. But these departments want to see that you can um, create a compelling case for your research um, because this is something that you'll have to do to get funding later on, um, as well as scoping out field sites, the theoretical underpinnings of your research. Um, and I would really recommend having um, your mentors and colleagues review this before submitting. Um, and so finally, I just wanted to flag some resources um, that could be helpful in your journey. Um, the SSH committee has a page on the APSA site that has um, a previous webinar. We're going to be recording it one um, again this year, but this is dedicated for SSH, um, where we'll be going into more detail about this process. 
Um, other ways to get involved is the Social Science and Humanities and Medicine um, Conference that's um, every two years. This is a great way for applicants to kind of network with um, the scholars um, and try to um, find new research opportunities as well. Um, and then there's also two other sites that we listed that have resources for applicants as well. And then also the database that I flagged before. Um, this is one of the most visited sites that we have because there aren't many places where all of this information about what programs are offered or consolidated. So um, we found that this has been a really valuable resource for applicants. And I think that's it. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for that. I think there's a lot of correlation between the SSH application process and then the things that, you know, the MD PhD programs um, outside of SSH look for. So we'll definitely email this out to those that registered. Um, and through the APSA website as well, you can get involved within our mentorship committee. So let's say you are considering MD PhD pathway and you just need some guidance from current trainees, you can definitely get involved with um, our mentorship committee. So at this point, I would like to introduce our student panelists. And firstly, just thank you for joining. I know everyone's like super busy. Um, so thanks for taking time out of your day. Um, so we'll just go from left to right and uh, just give me your name, the year, and also a highlight of your week. Derek? Hey, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Derek. Um, I'm in my ninth year, uh, my, my final year. Um, highlight of my week, my son recently um, started going to daycare. Had a little bit of a rough transition, but the past few days, he's been having good days. So, you know, I take those W's. Thank you. Britt? Hey, my name is Britt. I'm in my fifth year, I think. I feel like I always have to ask my classmates because I can't keep track anymore. I'm in my last couple months of my PhD, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, a highlight of my week, it's kind of like a, a bittersweet highlight, but I could finally lay down flat. So I was in a, like a slight accident and had an injury. And you don't know like how much you value the little things like being able to like lay flat and not sitting up for like a couple of weeks. So that's my big win for this week. Thank you, Britt. I'm glad you're feeling better. And Ankita, you've heard from, but please give us your year and your highlight. You guys are probably tired of me by this point. Um, uh, hi, guys. Um, I'm Ankita. I'm a fifth year in the MD PhD anthropology program at Penn. Um, the highlight of my week, um, I'm kind of concluding my summer field work in um, the Cambridge, Boston area. So um, this week, I've kind of just been hanging out with um, a lot of my collaborators and informants. Um, and yeah, it's been bittersweet, but I'm closing out this period of research. Thank you. And lastly, Carrie. Uh, Carrie is unable to make it today, um, uh, unfortunately, um, but I will be covering for her in the further uh, second part of the session with uh, Dr. AZA. Awesome. And now we're going to open up the floor to questions. So I will first start off with one that was submitted already. What are some things that you wish you would have known in your stage of training, some tips that you would give students that are currently applying? I can go first. Um, I wish I knew that it was okay to ask current medical students for advice or just like, you know, reaching out and asking about their journey. Um, because when I applied, I didn't know any medical students. I didn't, I had literally like no idea what was going on and really struggled with my applications. Um, but for the most part, like, at least in my school, like I'm at the University of Arizona in Tucson and everyone is super chill and super nice and welcoming. Like you could cold email someone and they would probably do everything they could to help you. Um, and then like as an undergraduate, I felt weird about asking for help. Like it's kind of like that first generation thing where you like think you can do it all your, on your own and you're like not willing to ask for help unless you like really need it. And I wish that I knew that it was OK to ask like for clarification and for help and for guidance a lot sooner. Um, because I was a reapplicant, so maybe the first time around, if I had a little more guidance, I probably would have done a little better. 
Um, I can go next. Um, more so just giving like some general advice, more on the research side. And this is like when when you're an undergrad or when you're, you know, going into your graduate years or post back or whatever. Um, who who you work with matters more than the particular project. You want to do something that's interesting. You want to explore your interests. You want to have that opportunity. But like nothing, nothing is more helpful than a mentor who just really goes to bat for you, really, you know, gives you different opportunities, really, you know, helps you to get to where you want to in your career. And, you know, if you have to choose between a lab you're interested in um, a lot, but, you know, have, you know, the mentor is, I don't know, super busy and doesn't get a chance to talk to people much versus a lab that you're you're interested in, but not as much as the other one. But the mentor is really well known for you know, really just highlighting his his trainees or her trainees and, and you know, allowing them to to blossom, then I'd say, you know, choose that latter one and just really focus on that. Yeah, I think these are great points. Um, I would also say, like, I think one of the biggest hurdles for me was, you know, I saw these, like, famous people doing MD-PhD social science pathways or even MD PhDs just generally and I didn't feel like that was something attainable for me so I wasn't really considering it um and it really took like a mentor to tell me in my senior year to consider it for me to actually um go forth and with this process um but I would say like take a step before that and um like actively seek out other MD PhD students and kind of their process applying and also their like personal journeys towards um, this program or the program that they chose. Um, because I think as much as like uh, informationally that helps them like how to actually apply, it also gives you a sense of like, oh, there are these other people who are slightly more relatable than like these high career like um, later stage career uh, physicians um, to really empower yourselves um, as you go forth with the application process and ch and choose to decide this pathway too. These are all great points. Um, is there a reason you did the MD PhD like joint program or I know Derek you had a different pathway um, as opposed to just doing a medical degree? I guess I can go first. <laughs> um, so for me, it was, I had a little bit of an interesting um, um, pathway to my career because, you know, going into undergrad, I'm from an area that just does not have a lot of opportunities. Um, went to undergrad, didn't really know much about anything. Uh, ended up really liking research. So fell in love with research, decided I want to do research. And then, you know, kind of towards the end of undergrad, I realized I also like medicine too. And by that point, I decided to do a post back and, um, get a chance to do some more research. And uh, during that time, I decided I wanted to keep doing that research. So I applied, you know, did a PhD at the, the same institution I was doing my research in. And this institution, luckily enough, had the opportunity to let you transfer into the MD-PhD program. So that's what I did during my final year. So to answer your question, the reason I did that route is just because of what I had access to and what I knew about at the time, but, you know, I guess a more general answer is, you know, for the PhD, um, I think if you want to do clinically relevant research, then it's really helpful to have a background in medicine. Um, the biggest thing is, you know, wanting to treat patients. If you want to treat patients, then you need to do the MD. So that by itself, you know, means choosing MD or MD PhD over PhD. Um, if you want formal good, you know, so I mentioned this earlier, but you really need to, I, I wouldn't say need, but it's super, it's super helpful to have formal training and, and the direct, you know, mentorship and the pathway of, you know, of, of earning a PhD really helps to gear you towards a career if you do want to be in the academic world. And the MD degree inherently does not do that. Uh, you can find res resources during medical school. Um, you can do, you know, fellowships afterwards. You can even get a PhD afterwards. But the actual MD training is work is focused entirely on patient care. So if you want to 
be somebody who sees patients and who um, has their own research career. Or, you know, if you want to do something different with your PhD, industry, government, whatever, whatever it is, then you it's helpful to do both and just have those together and have the funding set up and, you know, in most cases and not have to worry about, you know, trying to uh, figure out additional ways to to get research um, experience or to get into medical school later, which is what I have to figure out. So. It sounds like you follow your curiosities and let the path really just lead itself. I would say for me, I think I, I mentioned before, I found um, kind of what I was learning in medical anthropology to have like a really complementary relationship to kind of um, approaches to clinical care. Um, I, I became very interested in clinical practice, but there was something for me uh, very like uh, fulfilling also about doing qualitative research like that also made me happy. Um, and so it was hard for me to decide like one or the other. Another thing I think is um, important to consider is like the like longevity of research. So um, oftentimes medical students will do research, but it'll be kind of these short term projects. Um, and if if that's um, the form of research that you would want to engage with, then um, an MD might be um, a route that makes sense. But for a PhD, it's like over several years and the depth of research is um, like not comparable to like these shorter projects. And you come out of it with a body of work that you can call your own. Um, and so it, it's more of like a, a story of your research over several years. So the skills are quite different also. Um, and I obviously chose uh, the latter. For me, I guess it's kind of simple. I just knew that I loved both and I like couldn't decide. Like I knew that I loved research. I knew that I loved medicine. I really like um, like patient advocacy. I'm just chilling and talking to patients. Like, even if I'm a patient, I'm in a waiting room. I like talking to other patients. Like, I don't know. I just really like the just talking to people and helping them out and making them feel better. And then I also just love pipetting, I guess. I just really like the basic wet lab work. Um, so I, I kind of couldn't decide. And I didn't know that MD PhD was even an option until I was maybe a junior or I think I was a sophomore or junior in, in college. And I was like, whoa, that sounds really cool. And like, I felt like I could be really happy. And then I realized like, oh, they also waive tuition. That's kind of sweet too, because it's like exactly what I want to do. And there's like this little bonus. Um, so that's, I just kind of went for it and luckily got there. Uh, but I feel like no path is really straight towards like your goals. So like, no matter how you get there, I think you'll get there um, if you really want and you really like it. Yeah, I think a lot of people have that same um, mentality with MD PhD. They can't decide, you know, so just end up doing both. And then also, I think um, when you are in medicine, sometimes the answers that you're given or the treatment options that are available just aren't enough. And you have questions and, you know, really, you have to be given the resources to do the research and ask good questions to um, uh, get an answer out in the clinical setting. So I think in those types of situations where you're just a very curious person and you like going down rabbit holes, then the PhD, I think, is a really good um, opportunity to pursue. Um, I would ask you guys, I think it's nice that we have both medicine and PhD current students um, here. What are like your day-to-day, -day, at least recently? So I'm zooming in from like a mouse behavior room. So like I have like 40 mice just surrounding me. Um, I've been doing like memory tests like all day. I've been like doing water maze and like novel object testing. It's like a lot of really long behavior, but it's like very worthwhile um, because I do Alzheimer's work. So I'm like testing a new experimental drug for Alzheimer's. It's like very promising, super exciting, really long hours. Like I'll probably be here until like seven or eight o'clock tonight, but um, you kind of just make it work. Um, and then you try to like balance it out. So, you know, if you're here for like 12 hours one day, maybe you don't come in for 12 hours the next day. Um, luckily I have a really supportive mentor who uh, makes sure that I can kind of balance that out. But, you know, 
it's like a lot of meetings, but a lot of experiments, a lot of pet petting, a lot of hanging out with mice. Um, I really like it though. So I would say um, right now I'm in field work and I'll be going back to my last semester of classes, but during field work, um, it really varies based on the day, but um, my work looks at how uh, um, ideas of race and gender and um, pathology get um, uh, reformulated through um, AI and computer vision, as well as humans understand the body visually and how physicians learn to understand the body visually. Um, so right now I'm doing a lot of interviews with technology developers. I follow clinicians as they use some of, um, you know, medical imaging devices with AI. Um, I talk to patients. Um, I interview computer scientists. It really depends on um, the day, essentially. Um, and I would say for a lot of social science and humanities programs, they are quite class heavy. So for my program, um, it's about uh two and a half years of classes and so i'll be going back to campus next week and um taking classes and preparing to propose my dissertation before starting full-time field work um my days are uh, essentially a mix of preparing my my egress application i'm applying to im pstps in this cycle and also, I, I finished all of my core, clerk, uh, core clerkships um, or clinical rotations, and now I'm doing, you know, electives. It depends. Right now, I'm doing a pathology sub internship, and it's really nice. Uh, I wanted to be able to get a better idea of like how a pathologist, um, you know, evaluates or looks at slides and kind of get their their viewpoint on how things happen. It's been really helpful. But I mean, that's essentially what my day is. I'll, you know, do some of that and I'll go home, maybe work on my application, um, try to get letters together, things like that. So you, you both sides feel as though, you know, if you're in research, you're focusing on research, not trying to bring in clinic. And then if you're in clinic, you're focusing on your clinical opportunities as opposed to still trying to maintain some research. Awesome, awesome. Um, at this point, I would like to turn the floor to Dr. Cavazos, if the panelists could just hold on um, and we'll come back to the Q&A afterwards. First of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, and uh, as you can tell, I have been typing some answers and some things in the chat. Um, Great overview. I mean, there are multiple ways to get to this mountain of becoming uh, a physician scientist. And uh, there are a group of individuals who are late bloomers, uh, MDs, um, who come into the uh, realm and uh, get into a PSTP or may do a prolonged postdoc. But what you need to realize is the age to first, you know, big NIH grant is the same. And so the benefit of an MD PhD is that you have a community and a community is similar to what you are hearing here, um, where people are peer supporting each other, as well as you also have contacts vertically with individuals who are alumni, who are just graduating, who are interviewing and getting the tips on how to apply, how to put together an application, et cetera. So that's the great benefit of doing an MSTP. I did not do that. I am an MD, a PhD, then I did my residency. So what I have today is I'm going to show you if I and um, I do have a few slides. Um, and um, let me show you one. So I, like many individuals, became or study a basic science 
um, wet lab. I train essentially in experimental neuropathology and neurophysiology, studying, sorry, how the brain reorganizes in response to excitotoxicity and, and insult. And I took that component and I had to make the, the, the decision of where to go for residency and what kind of residency I wanted to do. At the time, uh, as, as it is now, I chose to do a, a residency. I thought I could have been a neurosurgeon, a neuropathologist, a neurologist. I made the decision based on the on what I really wanted to do and what was aligned with my goal, which was to do research. Neurosurgery is not impossible to become a PI but it is very difficult. And because all of these surgical specialties require hands, this is one of the reasons why if you look at the specialties, the specialties that tend to attract individuals who are MD-PhD tend to be specialties that allow you to uh, pursue investigation uh, at a more deeper level or a more sustained level. As a faculty member, we have to produce our salary. And surgical specialties have, generally speaking, higher, substantially higher salaries. And so you have to produce that salary. And so in order to make up that huge salary, it's much harder as a, as a surgical uh, scientist than as a, you know, a, a physician scientist. Um, and I'm talking about broadly, okay? Um, now, in my case, during residency, every year I kept publishing a paper and I did some clinical observations. And along the way, I, I did complete uh, studies that were um, uh, clinically translation of my area of expertise. When I became a faculty member, I obtain a KO8 award, which is one of the mechanisms NRSA to begin my own laboratory. I actually moved from the university. So I went to um, a PhD at, uh, at uh, Wisconsin. I did my residency at Duke. I then did my, uh, my first job at the University of Colorado. Once I had my KO8, I was there for three years. The conditions were not good in my situation, personal situation, as well as my circumstances. And I actually took it to my current location, which is the University of Texas in San Antonio, um, to the Health Science Center within that. I established my research laboratory in the VA Medical Center. The VA is very strict about the amount of clinical work that you need to do and hours that you spend. So it really protects you, relatively speaking, from the hours that I can spend in my research laboratory. And so I was able to develop a program that established um, and eventually got funded with a VA Merit Award, as well as an R01 as well as uh, a program project, trying to study how this brain reorganized in other locations in the, in the, uh, within the hippocampus um, and how that worked. At the same time, I did networking and uh, as a practicing neurologist, I started doing some clinical trials because it allowed me to have some discretionary funding to support students, to support other um, uh, people. And at the same time, it was I was able to extend observation. Many times the industry regulatory trials are not stuff that I, I personally design. However, I eventually became uh, the primary investigator of regulatory clinical trials. At the same time, I learned about healthcare outcomes. And uh, as the VA was one of the first places that became, um, have a, an electronic medical record. And so I started cranking studies and information of data 
And sometimes using the same uh, perspectives, you know, hypothesis-driven research, you are able to ask those questions. So in response to one of the questions and presentations earlier uh, by one of the panelists, in my career, I have done about 25 to, to 20 to 30 basic science articles. I done about um, 15 clinical observations. I done about 20 clinical trials. I done about 10 healthcare outcome uh, observations. And um, I consulted for and, and uh, became a co-founder for a company and uh, developed the, the science, the regulatory clinical trials, um, went through FDA approval for a regulatory trial for an FDA clear device, received the approval, the novel, and put it into the market. So my point, however, is all of these things were together about epilepsy. And one of the things that happened to me in the VA is that I became mostly a geriatric epilepsy neurologist. And, and eventually you start seeing then other comorbidities such as cerebrovascular disease and Alzheimer's disease as causes of epilepsy in the elderly. And so I, given the hippocampal sclerosis, which was my basic science um, uh, research, um, was also important in the aging uh, brain. So I actually, uh, in about 2017 or so, um, migrated into the Alzheimer's uh, grant. And at the moment, I'm 70% funded by NIH, um, mostly career development. So I'm the MSTP director, but I also have directed the CTSA uh, for KL2, that's career development. I noticed that that was one of the things that I, I found a lot of fulfillment. And so your purpose may change along your career. And so as long as you keep yourself curious, this is an amazing career. Your life is taken care of. Yes, indeed, you have to compete for grants and for papers, et cetera. But grants and papers, particularly papers, are your legacy. And so it provides you with the opportunity to mentor the next generation of physician scientists, of trainees, of students, and be able to um, support, um, you know, the next, the next group of scientists. You know, I, I did a presentation for, um, so uh, the other aspect is, you know, I have had 116 trainees with 47 PhD graduates, um, plus some fellows, plus some faculties. I've been a mentor of a bunch of grants. And, and so uh, along this journey, you take opportunities um, and you, you make the most out of your opportunities that were given to you. But your purpose is the most important thing. And the one thing that you can never compromise are your values. And in this particular case, integrity, commitment, and authenticity are the primary values. With that, I am going to stop. And I want to say, for me, there's no particular day that is, I mean, yes, there are particular days that are 100% clinical. I still see patients. I mean, three years ago, I was still doing 10 weeks of inpatient attending and had one half day a week for my clinic. And the rest of my time was research, training, um, and administration. And so, again, one of the things is it's never boring. You get to travel to amazing places, but just like this, which I, is a photo that I took, you know, there's a lot of peer support at lev different levels, and you're pushing people, including the earliest new trainees, like this kiddo. Um, you are pushing them a lot, okay? And so um, you, you do some really amazing um, things 
in this career and it is very rewarding. Thank you for those reflections. Uh, a question we got for you was, how do you navigate the expectations of academic medicine? So in terms of publishing, grant writing, and then clinical work. Okay, so this is where purpose is really important. You need to pay yourself first. Why are you doing this? If that is because of academic medicine, the daily demands, and as I said earlier, the daily demand is produce RVUs as an academic physician. We all have RVU targets. RVUs are relative value units. If you are in medicine 100% and you're in private practice, you start your day by being $1,000 in debt because you already have, you pay the lights, you pay the plays, et cetera, et cetera. Guess what? Those individuals have very little incentive to do research, okay? So it depends on what you want to do. So if you want to do academic medicine, you need to be publishing. And so writing, even if it is writing a critical review because your grants have not been funded, and you need to do something. You need to develop a plan. And that plan implies, you know, you are doing, you, you double dipping or triple dipping. You're writing a grant. For a grant, you need to develop the, you know, uh, 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 an area of importance. Why do I care to a gap of knowledge? And how to address this gap of knowledge, you have your hypothesis. Well, that introduction in itself can be a critical review. And so what you have to do is you have your slides and, you know, I am presenting a slide. I actually save this slide into my computer and I save it with each of the papers that I review. So as I read papers, I save slides that will allow me in a, you know, in a situation where I need to give a presentation, you know, the ability to copy and paste slides. So one of the things that happens is that you become efficient at pushing what matters. And what matters is going to be science and manuscripts and then grants. Now, for every 10 grants that you do, you send to, you know, R ones, one or two, or maybe three, get funded. Not very many. So this is the reason why you have to read the reviews and be able to pivot and have multiple eggs in baskets. As you notice in my career, I thought that my grants, my grants were advancing and some of them were not. And, and so I said to myself, I need to have a, a clinical trial component. And that's how I started doing a clinical trials. Well, at the same time, I was doing my lab, laboratory investigation. If you look at my CV, I still in the last um, 10 years, I have about five or six, at least basic science papers. I have five or six clinical papers. I have five or six, you know, of each. So the point is you are making contributions at different levels, but you pay yourself first. And so, yes, indeed, there are multiple days that are very intense and, you know, you work very hard. There are days that I take my, my camera and go on photographs and do things um, that, I do for fun. So you take wellness very seriously. I mean, I coach my kids in in their sporting activities, but I go home from four to eight and kids went to my wife and I went to my basement to write. Okay. Uh, so you find ways that you are you become effective at doing things. It's incredible that I am paying so much for doing what I love. 
So you're still seeing patients, correct? Correct. I'm still doing papers. I'm doing science. I do not have a lab uh, anymore. I'm doing team science. Partly this is because I went too high in administration and it is so difficult, you know, as an associate dean of two schools um, to be doing this. But as I said, I mean, this very morning, I um, advised the career of an individual who um, just became junior faculty member this year. She's doing amazing things. I interacted with her science. I changed her science. I refocused the science by asking the simplest questions. Why should I care about this? And, you know, going back and forth, we brainstormed why that was important and what are the elements that she needs to be putting together. So out of my KL2 trainees, um, I have thus far, um, I mean, it's not necessarily the case, uh, but in the Alzheimer's group, I have 100% funding, eventual funding of something. So it could be a K08, it could be a K23, a K01, R01, R21. And so my trainings are advancing because just like in the photo here, we are helping them along the way. So this is where community and where programs like PSTP are the reason why you are able to maintain a cohort of individuals and with help along the way. Now, some specialties do not have PSTPs and you need to understand what is their research track um, to be able to accomplish that. That brings me to a good question, actually. How important has mentorship been in your journey? And I also open this to the student trainees that are present too. So how um, did you have you got you guys find your mentors that have supported your career goals? So both from the mentor perspective and mentee perspective. Well, I have got terrible mentors and ter and amazing mentors, and my success is precisely from being able to access some of these amazing mentors. And mentoring never ends. I'm still I'm sixty one. I still have mentors. And I have mentors for functions. This is important. When you are asking someone to mentor, is to mentor you for what? And it needs to be for either the science, a technique, the content, career development of a particular component. There needs to be a purpose for each of those mentoring relationships. I hate when somebody says, can you be my mentor? Okay. The first, the first question that I ask, of what? Because it needs to have a purpose. And if there's no purpose specifically, I'm not the correct person to be asking. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add to that. Um, <laughs> I agree. It's, it's really good to have a diverse set of mentors. As it go as it comes to like approaching finding mentors, you know, completely agree with what he said. It's figure out what you need mentorship on and then ask that specifically. And yeah. Yeah, that's great advice. And I think looking back, I definitely had um, you know, a mentor for the social sciences, a matter a mentor for the medical sciences, um, a mentor for like scientific research because I was also involved in that and kind of having conversations of like what made sense for what I was interested in um and also like making sure that these are people who um, you trust and you can have like honest conversations with and that they can have honest conversations with you because there'll be many ups and downs throughout your journey it's not always going to be successes and so Having someone that you can talk about failures with, challenges, um, is really important and has um, been really great. Mentoring is not to get you an applause. It's to be a reflection. And I can tell you, I may cry uh, at least a third of, or if not half of my students, because what you want to do is you care for them 
but you need to be sometimes really, um, you know, this is what you're missing. And you have to be sometimes the mirror of showing them. These are the things that you're missing out of to get you to be great. You have the potential to be amazing. But this is, you need to work on this. Thank you. Um, at this point, if there are any final questions from the audience that we could answer that hasn't been answered already, um, we could take them at this time. Feel free to leave those uh, questions in the chat. Um, in the meantime, we ask all the panelists to stay on and we'll take a five minute bathroom break. So uh, we'll be back at uh, 7.11. And then after that, we will go into uh, the second half of the panel. Hi, Dr. Aza, is that correct? Uh, AZA. AZA, okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you for joining. I think they're on a um, quick break right now. Um, okay, great. And we're just wrapping up the first part, and we'll get back to the second part soon. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Thanks.
Okay, so we're going to pick up the session again. Uh, thank you again to our JEDI committee and panelists for that incredible session exploring the physician scientist pathway. For the last 45 minutes to an hour, we'll, we will have our panelists from the previous session, as well as Dr. AZA, talk about their journey to becoming an MD PhD, what they enjoy as a physician scientist, as well as challenges that they faced. So you've heard from our current trainees already. Now I allow Dr. Alsop uh, to uh, uh, give a brief introduction. So uh, Dr. Alsop, uh, please go ahead. Hey, everyone. Um, it's good to be here and be able to be in community with you all. Um, I'm an artist and physician scientist in the Department of Psychiatry at Yale and Howard University. Um, I also direct the Center for Collective Healing and um, serve as medical director for our crisis center in, in New Haven. And yeah, I mean, I really love, you know, where I'm at right now in, in uh, my career. I'm in my second year um, on, on the tenure track and do translational research spanning from rodent models through, um, you know, human, uh, both basic and translational models, looking at music, mindfulness, and psychedelics as uh, potential forms of community and group-based uh, treatment. I didn't know that I wanted to do an MBD PhD going into college. I went to North Carolina Central University, um, an HBCU in North Carolina, where I majored in biology and minored in jazz studies and philosophy. Um, and started off doing molecular cancer biology at that time and got really excited about basic science um, and started doing summer research at a few places, ended up um, going to do my MD PhD at the Harvard MIT program and felt a switch from um, oncology, which is what I thought I was going to do, to psychiatry, ended up doing my PhD in neuroscience. Um, at that time, very basic systems neuroscience and still felt pretty far coming back to medical school. In fact, I wasn't even sure I wanted to um, if I was going to go back to medical school or not, ended up going back. And then um, from there, really fell in love with psychiatry and did a research track um, residency program at Yale, where I learned some human neuroscience and started to integrate that into what is now um, my lab. And, you know, I think there have been a lot of different challenges. Mostly, I think a lot of it have to do with time management and balancing uh, life inside and outside of academia, family, all those different obligations. But the thing I love most about this career path is um, the flexibility and the ability to really chart your own course and follow your your intellectual curiosity. And I think um, it is really a privilege to be able to have time to be able to just think about things that are really passionate, that you're passionate about and solve problems that um, you know, can make a difference. And I think being in a position where you also can serve people directly as a clinician, um, to me really adds to, uh, adds to the, the, the joy and the gratitude I feel, you know, in this career path. So I'm really, yeah, excited to be with you all and answer any questions. Thank you so much. And to, the, and to the panelists, thank you all for being here. We're grateful you took the time out of your day to come virtually to our meeting, uh, to provide your wisdom and of wisdom to folks wanting to learn more about the physician scientist pathway. Uh, my name is Salim. I'll be your moderator. I'm a first year master's student in human nutrition at Columbia University, and our volunteer live tweeting the event will be Jonathan Sanchez. Uh, for those of you who are going to step away, as a reminder, we will uh, this meeting will be recorded. Um, as the moderator, I'll remind you to please submit your questions to the Q and A box as you have been. Uh, we have a team of co-moderators uh, collecting uh, questions live, and you can submit the questions in the chat, chat box. Um, that's all the announcements that I have. Thank you again for all being here. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and start with the first question. Um, so first, what are some of the unique challenges you face as a physician scientist? Well, I think one of the unique challenges really is if you are doing if you are doing you know both and practicing both is that uh, that time management. I think the clinical clinical schedule can be uh, pretty rigid and demanding, and patients also like really deserve your attention and your presence um, when you're with them. Um, and at the same time, research is something that's kind of always moving at a different pace. And requires you to, you know, sometimes respond to things in, in a in in a different way. So I think really balancing out that schedule and finding the right um that right balance where you feel like you are 
having the time to do your research and write grants and get papers out and all those things are really important while also still being, you know, uh, a good clinician and, you know, preferably an excellent clinician and really being there for your patients, I think is a unique challenge that if you're primarily or only doing research or, or really focus uh, on, on solely clinical care, you don't have to really try to, to achieve that sort of balance. Thank you. Um, uh, moving on to the next question. What do you enjoy about your career? Any of the panelists can feel free to answer this question as well. I, I don't want just Dr. Alsop to answer. Um, but um, yeah, so um, feel free to uh, uh, chip in wherever you uh, feel like the question resonates with you and, and you can offer a, a question, uh, an answer to the question. Yeah, for me, like what I've enjoyed the most so far in this career is the ability to really build um, build teams around ideas that are that people are passionate and excited about and to kind of see uh, see projects develop from an idea or curiosity, something that is like a nagging thought into actual experiments with with real data and controls. And that process is something that has always excited me about science, especially like the beginning part, the ideation and like figuring out how to make it a practical experiment that gives you information. And so being able to do that with trainees and like be a part of that process with teams and the flexibility that that allows for just the 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 areas of pursuit and, and inquiry has been really uh, a big part of, of uh, the reward I get from this career. And the other thing is the flexibility. Like I really like being able to set my own you know, schedule in lab in a way that I can't do when it comes to my clinical schedule. So I, I really enjoy that flexibility. Flexibility seems like it's uh, off, uh, giving you the ability to um, really determine what goes on in your day and just do a lot of uh, a lot of what interests you. Um, moving on to the next question, uh, looking back on your career. Is there any advice you would give to your undergraduate self? Try, you know, challenge yourself. Um, dream big. Believe in yourself. But at the same time, understand how much work is to do that. You know, when I was a neuroscience PhD student, um, I took a class uh, in cancer biology genetics because I wanted to hear a class with a Nobel laureate. And it was the hardest class because I had to learn so much so quickly. This is, this is before Sanger's uh, technology. So I, I learned DNA, the the old-fashioned way, um, you know, things change. Um, so be nimble. Uh, that's another another piece. Uh, don't just be, don't, be a scientist. Be fascinated by the scientific process. Don't be a technical girl of just one technique because that technique may become obsolete. Be multidisciplinary. Be curious across the sciences. Read, um, you know, take the last issue of Nature of Science. Try to read it all. The old-fashioned way we used to have those journals. Uh, rather than just the, you know, skipping, you know, learn about, you know, science. I mean, if you're a DNA person, uh, learn about uh, anthropology of ancient DNA. I mean, it's amazing what, what goes on. Um, try to learn about social determinants of health, how much, how critical and important they are to um, 
to our gaps of knowledge and application uh, of, of uh, scientific concepts. Thank you so much for that answer. It seems like it's important to just push yourself, as you said, and um, keep powering through as you go through uh, that physician scientist pathway. Moving on to the next question, what made you decide being a physician scientist was necessary over being just a physician or just a scientist? I think for me, the the training and the ability to do both felt like if I didn't have either of the, the, the other one, it would be, it, it felt a little incomplete. Like I really love science, but there was something special about seeing the scientists I was working with interact with patients that, that we were studying in the lab and that ability to like actually touch the person and, and be with them in a certain way was something that was really exciting for me. At the same time, it felt as though there were really important questions, particularly within psychiatry, that I just would not have the tools to really be able to approach if I didn't have the kind of research training that you get dedicating the time to doing a PhD. And so that really was ultimately what led me to to pursue kind of getting the training for both. And I think it's hard to project ahead, you know, nine years, eight years, 10 years. But I felt, though, that even if I ended up not doing, you know, a 50-50 sort of career, or even 80-20, that that period of training would really help me to understand problems and, and be able to to kind of engage in solutions. And so that is is what, you know, pushed me in that direction. And the other thing is that percentages will change. I mean, I've been 80% research, 20% uh, 20, 20 clinical, and being 50-50, I've been, you know, Really, uh, this uh, I mean, this week uh, I did I saw one patient. Um, last week I saw ten. Um, but you know, every week is different. It's the the thing that keeps running me is I can keep being curious. I can keep asking scientific questions. I am amazed by science, and you know. And the other thing is you are being proven wrong. <laughs> you know, science pro proves you wrong many of the times. I mean, you throw the dice and you have this nice model and it just doesn't work. Sometimes that is the most interesting thing. I had this model, it just doesn't work. So there must be something else uh, to explain, you know, this complex interaction or results. Be humble. Kind of going off of that, um, as an MD-PhD trainee, we often hear that your PhD research focus doesn't have to necessarily match up with what you end up doing in the clinic. What are your thoughts on that? And did your own PhD training reflect that? Um, yeah, I was, I was also trained in an environment and a program where it was felt that like your PhD training doesn't really have to map onto what you end up doing for research or even necessarily what your clinical, um, you know, specialty is. And I think in many ways that is true because the PhD is really preparing you and giving you tools to understand how to engage in science, how to ask questions, how to design experiments to actually give us information that could lead us to answers to those questions. And that skill set is is transferable across a, a, a you know a broad domain of things. That being said, I think if you can find a synergy between what you're doing in your PhD, what you're going to do clinically, and there's like a sort of a trajectory, in some ways, it might be easier to kind of just use those skills and transfer them to like a research track residency program or or that kind of thing. So I think there can be some advantages to having alignment between what you're doing your PhD in and what you end up doing clinically or the end, you know, the research trajectory that you end up taking. But I do agree with the idea that the PhD training really is a a a, a broad skill set kind of domain training that that is transferable and doesn't have to be tied necessarily to what you end up doing in your career or what your clinical specialty will be. And you will be reinventing yourself. 
multiple times along your career, and that's okay. And in fact, if you don't reinvent yourself, you're stale. I mean, just you you become obsolete. Um, you know, the other thing is to not worry so much about what I mean. Find a good mentor for your PhD. Um, the only time where the 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 science is more critical than your mentor quality is when you are doing your PSTP postdoc uh, a year before you start your faculty career because there is, there is actually research that shows that that is the skill set that you are, I mean, the technical last piece that you are going to be taking to your faculty the next 10 years of your launch um, uh, career. And, and yes, indeed, it's hard, but let me tell you, funding rates for case are in the 50 percentiles, okay? Now, that means apply and resubmit. So if you really want to do this, there are multiple entries and, you know, again, the VA has a career development award. Multiple foundations within your uh, societies have career developmental awards. Do not worry so much. Um, one of my trainees uh, did in, inflammasom in, in pneumonia sepsis. She ended up doing OBGYN. What she's doing now? Inflammation in the placenta. You can reinvent your, I mean, keep yourself broad. You just need to apply your training to new problem. It seems like being a physician scientist is something that allows you to take uh, clearly uh, information from a lot of different broad perspectives. And I appreciate you uh, sharing uh, your feedback. Uh, moving to the next question. Uh, will you or are you actively working as a physician and as a scientist right now? Yes. Yes, as well. Last year, I was focused. Last year was my first year on the tenure track. So I really focused on setting up the lab and, you know, hiring my game, my first hires, things like that. Um, but then this year, I've started back with um, with my clinical uh, clinical duties. So. Thank you. Next question is, how important has mentorship been in your journey? And how did you find mentors that supported your career goals? I alluded to that earlier. I mean, I have had um, tormentors, not just mentors. <laughs> um, but my point is, you need to know yourself. Be very honest and frank with yourself. Understand yourself and your needs uh, because the mentors that you need to be looking for are the people who align with your, your educational needs. Um, just because somebody is a novel laureate doesn't mean that that person is going to be a good mentor for you. In fact, more likely they are in a super lab and they are not going to be caring so much for you. Um, I mean, super lab in the sense of multiple labs. Um, th there's always, you need to understand what is the structure that you need, where you need, um, you know, relative hand-holding early on, structure uh, interactions, or, um, uh, you know, more independence and letting you fail before you succeed. Now, um, you also need to understand that there are multiple competencies uh, for becoming a physician scientist. You need to write grants. You need to write papers. You need to be, uh, you know, I'm outstanding in brainstorming. <clears throat> I'm terrible at writing. And I know myself. So I know for me to write, I have initial writing and editing. I'm a really good editor. I am a terrible writer, but I need to force myself to have outlines and structure. And, and so you find your ways to do that. And, um, and, and so 
in that way, you find eventually collaborators that complement your skill sets and you find mentors for skills that you are not that good at. Um, you know, eventually, if you become program director, you need actually a mentor to learn about the ropes of program directorship. Uh, training grants are very different than research, uh, than arrow ones, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Use your societies, learn from someone in that society. So if you are interested in Himong and you go to the Leukemia Society, um, learn about, uh, you know, uh, some individual who is more near peer um, because so often they just went through it. You know, a criticism that uh, has been given to me is that, you know, I'm an old fart that has gone, that has been successful. Yes, I'm, as I said uh, in one of my answer, I'm more resilient than a cockroach. Um, and you need to learn that. You might not be the brightest, but I will be outworking you. And again, learn about the tricks about for imposter syndrome. Completely agree that mentorship is just such a critical aspect and having mentors for different skills, different aspects of your career, having a mentorship team, particularly as you progress in your career, I think becomes really, um, really critical. I certainly wouldn't be where I, you know, where I am if I didn't have mentors who really took an interest in me, not just as a scientist or physician scientist, but as, as a human, you know, as a person developing. So. Thank you. Um, so uh, this next question is, how has your career evolved since you completed your training? Do you want to start, Asa? Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I completed my training all of my training about two years ago. So it hasn't evolved as much. I would say the biggest evolution has been from focusing solely on rodent based models of, uh, of behavior and, and, and disease to now actually also doing human work and sort of um, beginning to, to really think about translation and how to do that within the same lab space has been the biggest, you know, evolution uh, so far. I, des I describe my evolution, um, but I still keep doing lab science, basic investigation. I'm mean, still involved with that in a team science. I mean, I, I had about $2 million of equipment that I distributed in three labs, and I'm still utilizing uh, some of that equipment, but I am uh, letting it to be utilized in a more, uh, you know, better way. While at the same time, um, about 80% of my time is about uh, helping others be doing more, better science or, or more effective science. So a lot of times is, I mean, as I said, why should I care about reading this manuscript? Why, you know, you're, you have not done a persuasive case here. Um, so understanding purpose for me, the, pur the my purpose it change from my science to primarily the science of others, to training others, and it's it's actually hard, but at the same time it's so rewarding. You're gonna be mentoring. You already as trainees are near near peers. To high school students in the lab, you know, who come from a summer, to the next guy who's gonna take over your project as a postback. Um, cherish those experiences because those experiences are something that you are gonna scale eventually as you become a mentor. Thank you. Uh, so our last question, um, how has your identity shaped your experiences in medicine and research? Well, here we have uh, two minority, um, uh, you know, physician scientists. Um, you know, my skin is hard enough. Um, I've been told that I became program director because I'm a 
Mexican American Hispanic, um, you know, it makes you it, it, it you have had a lot of um, a lot of uh, micro and macro overtly aggressions, um, and you just need to a be comfortable with your own skin, be comfortable with your own science, know that your science is making a difference to people, and celebrate your triumphs and you know uh, learn from your mistakes it's very hard to learn from your mistakes it's very hard to receive a study section review even though i write them uh since i have had 20 something years in study section you know learn being told that your science is trash is not a constructive criticism tell me why my science is not as innovative or is not as transformational, or how can it become better at translating a discovery to practice? If you tell me is because this receptor has uh, has been modulated uh, by clinicians and you know it hasn't been shown to be effective, well, I take that feedback and I need to learn about that particular receptor or, or other receptors. I may need to change. But give me constructive criticism as compared. So out of a, st a study section negative review, I only highlight the things that I believe I can learn from it. Yeah, I think identity is such an important factor in shaping all of our experiences and you know how we interpret them. And so I think being from a marginalized group or a group that isn't as represented um, in the environment you're in is always sort of an additional challenge, an additional aspect of having to navigate, you know, those uh, those systems that you are trained in, are being trained in, will be trained in within academia. And so I think um, for me, identity has always also been about community and being able to find community in people that look like me and also being able to find community um, with people that don't look like me and have different backgrounds and different sets of experiences um, and I've been able to 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 find both sets of community, and that's been really helpful to deal with the kinds of micro and macro aggressions that Dr. Cavazos uh, mentioned. All right. Well, um, we don't have any more questions um, that were submitted. If anybody has any additional questions, I'm going to leave a minute or so for them to submit it in the Q&A box. Um, but in the meantime, uh, to everybody, thank you for joining us for a Q&A session today with current students and faculty. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for their time, as well as the participants who made this session so interactive. And so many people, including APSA Jedi Committee, the Public Relations Partnership Committee, and APSA leadership that not only put these sessions together, but also worked to make sure that you, the applicants, receive word of it as well. Our next interactive session will be on interview tips on October 3rd, 2024 from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. So please stay tuned if you are applying to a program this year. More information can be found on our website at physicianscientist.org slash page slash interactive session. And I am going to add that into the chat right now. So please feel free to click on that link uh, for more information on future interactive sessions. Please also stay tuned uh, via social media and look out for future emails to register for upcoming events. Just checking the Q&A box here. Um, so uh, this is a uh, relatively long message. Um, so um, since this is the last message, I'll just read it out to everybody. Uh, Dr. Alsop, FDA has recently rejected MDMA assisted Therapy is not due to its due diligence. It is due to the company Lycos Therapeutics. They did not provide sufficient data on its clinical trial, and more importantly, due to allegations of sexual abuse on the part of an unlicensed therapist at one of the trial sites. The point I wanted to raise is, raise is that MDPHD 
we need to critically read scientific papers on drugs, including psychedelics, because we are in a powerful position to make changes for the people most vulnerable. Uh, so uh, this is not my field, but I've been FDA reviewer uh, for a panel, for four panels. And uh, one of the panels that I participated uh, it was for um, uh, cannabidiol, which is one of the drugs of can of uh, marijuana in ep uh, that was being used for epilepsy. Um, I will tell you that the process is actually very scientific and very very strong. Um, I will invite you people that you peruse the materials and methods of the FDA for a par any particular hearing of this type and, you're, and learn and read the, um, the entire presentation by the FDA um, uh, group of statisticians, et cetera. They do actually do statistics and uh, when an individual or a particular site has been shown to be um, erratic, they actually remove the site and rerun the statistics with, with FDA parameters. The, the things that you will find is that sometimes because of a loss, a lesser number, um, the power of the study will be diminished dramatically. But I, I wanna make, make, make clear that while, you know, an allegation of this sort um, might be uh, tainting a particular clinical site or a particular uh, piece, it is a very rigorous uh, process. And um, you might find a lot of information from just reading the proceedings and the actual deliberation. Um, there is a portion that is a completely open panel, including all the concerns and the voting issues of each of the panelists. So um, I've been on, on record for a drug that was eventually removed when I indicated particularly that um, polymorphisms um, might be likely given that this had been only studied in a very small population of individuals who were Caucasians. And you know, eventually it was found that there were some issues uh, uh, and it was withdrawn. Um, again, because of a very limited class when they were looking at a particular clinical trial. So regardless, um, I invite you to go to the FDA panel site and read the materials of uh, that particular um, uh, panel advisory. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think... Um... Yeah, it's really important, I think, as MD PhDs to to understand like the primary literature. And so I definitely encourage people to look at like the phase one, phase two, phase three study results. And um yeah, I think that you know the FDA is is doing the role that it is designed to do. And they help Lycos to design the study. And you know, they'll be in further con you know, conversations to um do more experiments. You know, I think. Um, yeah, there's a much larger conversation we can have here, but I think the FDA is doing its role. And I think that it's still clear that within psychiatry, we are in a new era of, of treatment mm -hmm. models. You know, mm -hmm. eventually we will have to figure out how do these medicines actually become um, accessible and scalable and we're on the pathway to doing that. And I think mm -hmm. this FDA rejection is not the end of that process. It's a part of that right. process. Just like reviewing exactly. a paper makes it better. Mm-hmm. Thank you all for your contribution to this session today. Um, so I'm going to end the session now, but again, thank you so much. Thank you for the invite and uh, best wishes to all of you. You can find me in LinkedIn or, uh, you know, and you have my uh, academic uh, email there if you want to explore a particular question. Best wishes.